happy to welcome Colin Frazier from Colorado College. And I just have a brief introduction for him, and then I'm going to let him talk about all the good stuff. But um, Colin is a graduate of Colorado College, and then he worked as a um, commercial letterpress printer with Blue Barn House in North Carolina. Um, and then went back to Colorado College in 2006 to rebuild their program there with the press, both in teaching and production. Um, he has lots of interests, including um, some of the, in the I'm sure you see a lot of that coming out in his work. But in the summertime, he works with um, National Outdoor Leadership Schools and leader field instructor um, in the Mountain West. So that's very brief, and there's lots more to call in that I'm sure that you can share with us. But um, I hope you enjoy this talk. Uh, I look forward to meeting all of you. It's real nice to be here in Florida. I've never been here before. And um, I, I want to thank uh, SCAP and uh, all the representatives of SCAP and the Visiting Artists uh, series for, for having me. This is a real pleasure. And um, I am going to try, in, in the Olympic spirit, I'm going to try to <laughs> leap some technological boundaries by using a borrowed iPhone to control the PowerPoint presentation. So let's see how this goes. Bear with me. Um, cool. So this this uh, this is sort of a it's about a few journeys. What I'm going to talk about tonight, and uh, this is uh, along my way, my journey to Florida. I drove here from Colorado uh, a week and a half ago, and this is uh, when people who are interested in typography and letters and things like that um, are real big dorks usually, and I am included. In that. And this is kind of like my big dork out. So this is like, I pull over off the side of the highway in Texas to take photographs of things like this. Um, this may not make any sense to you, but it's a, uh, clarinet is a kind of type, and Memphis was like one of the original, like, I think it was maybe a Mac system font or something when it first came out. And then this is also, the whole state of Texas is covered in, um, in this new typeface that all the highway signs are in, which is called Clearview which is, uh, they've been developing for 10 years doing legibility studies with type to uh, create a typeface that is uh, recognizable at great distances. It's um, a vast improvement over the old highway gothic. And so I've seen it a little bit around Tallahassee, but this is like the kind of things that uh, people like me tend to look at. Um, so it's about, it's about journeys. Um, a couple different journeys. One journey is the journey of a printer who started the press at Colorado College originally. Um, and then there's sort of my journey in, uh, uh, in navigating Colorado College's press, and also my travels here in Florida, which is a big part of the reason that I'm here and, and the work that I'm doing. Um, fire up the iPhone. Great. It works. It works. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So the press at Colorado College was started in the uh, late 70s. Um, I'm, uh, this is going to be a very conversational sort of talk, so feel free to fire up your hand if you have a question or just throw it out at me. Uh, I want the lights on so I can see you all. Um, but, so the Press at Colorado College was started in the late 70s by a faculty member of the art department named Jim Trissel. And um, Jim was a painter by trade, and uh, he was also an art historian and had been teaching at the college for a number of years when he got kind of roped into, like a lot of us printers do, uh, hauling a bunch of press equipment around. Um, some stuff had been donated to the college. And one of the previous presidents wanted to start a fine press. Uh, this was something at the time, in the late 70s, it was, it was an era where you could pick up a lot of equipment for uh, next to nothing. Uh, this was a time when letterpress printing was going really out of style quick. And if you were a printer and you didn't get the new offset pr presses, then you were going on. So uh, he, he gained an interest in this stuff, sort of being roped in, sort of by being roped into moving the equipment, and then also by uh, the aesthetic qualities of ink on paper, which was not achievable uh, as a painter. He, there was a different surface quality to the, to the media that he was interested in. Um, and he very much founded it on this idea of, uh, of production. So originally the press uh, was about making things, and it was also a teaching press. It was about involving students in the making of those things as well. Um, it had, it had four basic components, uh, poster press, which the students were heavily involved in and uh, took a leadership role in. Uh, it produced broadsides and ephemera for visiting writers and other people who came and visit the college. Um, they produced small books and then they also produced some larger scale work. Um, oh, 
Uh, so here's a picture of Jim. This is uh, probably in the early 80s. Um, and this was the press, as it was, set up at the Fine Arts Center, which is right next to campus. Uh, we have a very small school. Uh, Colorado College is 1,800 uh, undergraduate students. It's a very small master's in teaching program, uh, but no other graduates. Um, so Jim started his, uh, his printing career by, uh, by learning as much as he could, reading, going, uh, traveling, and learning from other printers. And, um, then investigating the medium in his, uh, his time off, uh, doing, doing his research uh, as a member of the faculty um, and producing book work. And he gained uh, quite a bit of notoriety in the field uh, as a book artist um, at a time when fine printing was just sort of uh, coming of age. Um, I brought a few of, a couple of the books that I'm going to show you examples of, but I'm just going to show you a few of his books that were sort of at the pinnacle of his career that I think are the most interesting. Uh, so one of these is a broadside series. This is uh, 24 broadsides of American poetry. Um, it, he was a friend of Dana Joyas, who was the head of the NEA until just recently, I think, uh, just in the last couple of years he stepped down. Um, and so this, these were 24 up-and-coming American poets. Uh, and he, uh, he created this broadside series um, with Dana Joya. They curated it and then uh, had paper made, specifically this is usually handmade paper, Printed from handset type uh, polymer plates and, and um, photo engravings, and um, I have the set of those. This is my teaser. If you come to the open house, I actually have a set of these that I brought from our collection that you can look at. Um, they're very beautiful, and, and some of these poets went on to have uh, really wonderful careers, and are some of uh, the most well-known American poets. Um, so this was one of the this was this was the thing that really established him on the scene. It was a very ambitious project to do 24. Um, gonna have to go to the, buttons. Uh, the other book that this is perhaps his most well-known work, and the cool thing about this one is that you actually have it in your special collections at Florida State. So this is something you can go and look at. Um, I actually have a copy of it here, but you can go out and look at it uh, in your library too. Uh, this is called Color for the Letterpress. Again, he was interested in um, in the way that letterpress printing changed the way you perceived color. So he, you can see that he was doing a lot of uh, overlay of transparent colors here. He explored um, blues in this spread. And this was made as a teaching device um, in the way that Joseph Albers produced prints for uh, teaching. Uh, and it was housed in this, this oak box with a, with a sort of funny uh, molded plastic liner. And I encourage you to come up and look at this uh, on your way out. But it was, it was made as this giant accordion fold book. So an accordion expands outward. And, and it was used um, so that it could be used as a teaching tool. You could expand it and see the entire thing. I'll try to hold this up just to give you an idea of some of the spreads. So there's some explanatory stuff in the beginning. And then there are these spreads of color that are just very beautiful. Uh, the pigmentation in these inks is just lovely. And um, the overprinting effect creates uh, real dense colors. Uh, so he was exploring the relationships between colors as they could be printed on the letterpress. Yeah. Um, if you haven't never seen one, the library actually has a Joseph Albers uh, early color, one of the color books. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, I would love to see that. Uh, the screen, the screen prints. People in the room know that, but they have it. I don't know where uh, it is it's there, but I've seen it before. It's, it's oh, wow. Cool. So that's cool. So anybody who hasn't seen that stuff, yeah. that would be amazing. That'd be great. So here are some other um, uh, studies in um, taking complementary colors and putting them next to each other. And then overprinting them to create these browns and grays. Um, uh, the, uh, another another book that he produced. This uh, he took a year of sabbatical and got some research funds together and created uh, a book of hours, which was a monastic devotional book that was popular in the Middle Ages, uh, guiding you through prayers for the day. Uh, and I have a copy of this up here. This this was. Um, uh, you know, he was, he was pushing a definition of what made up a book, and people are doing this to an even greater degree today. But the idea behind this one is that it's um, very painterly in effect, but he was creating these spreads with poetry as well. Um, and I'll leave this out so people can, that are creating your next seat can come up and see this. Um, but it's very beautiful. Uh, so this was kind of, uh, this was the stuff that Jim uh, became really well known for. It's very beautiful work. He, his uh, sense of color was really exquisite. Um, so there's me. 
Uh, this is a, we're going to go right into my story. Okay, so my journey uh, to the press. I didn't know Jim uh, very well. I met him as a student in 1998 when I started as an undergrad. Uh, but he died of cancer that year. Um, he, he was 68, um, and he passed away very suddenly, uh, and unfortunately. But um, the, the, the other sad thing was that the college was really challenged to keep the press afloat without faculty, without a faculty member who had the expertise and the uh, knowledge to keep it going. So uh, the press floundered and, and almost went kaput uh, for a number of years, from 98 until I was hired in 2006. It only had very part-time support uh, uh, from a staff uh, side and also just a financial perspective. Um, there were people at the college who were interested in reviving it and they were able to raise enough money to hire a full-time position uh, when I started in 2006. So I, I, I went over to the press as, a, as an undergraduate student and it was the kind of thing, like it was like the love at first sight kind of thing where you walk in the door and you smell things and you look at things and you kind of just know that that's where you want to be. So I, I did that, I, I walked in there and I just, there was somebody working there part-time, maybe 10 hours a week, and I would just go over there uh, during my free time and try to suck up as much as I could. Uh, and ended up moving uh, through, uh, twisting along a winding path, ending up back in North Carolina working as a printer for a number of years. And then returning to the press uh, when they needed somebody to help rebuild, rebuild the program. Um, I, I don't do it by myself. Uh, we, uh, I'm not a faculty member at the college, I'm a staff member. Uh, I teach and I do curriculum work for the school uh, as well as running the shop. But I depend a lot on the other faculty members who bring uh, their own disciplines and perspectives into the press. So, so this is a teacher in the glasses. This is Steve Hayward, who's a, who's a faculty member of the English department. And uh, our interdisciplinary curriculum allows us to bring uh, studio art classes, uh, English classes, and history classes into our program uh, to uh, help kids learn about this stuff. And, uh, you can see these students, this is, this is a totally posed shot, this is like a video, you know, but um, looking very intently at this type. Uh, so, they're, so they're learning how to set some type. They, we were working on a little book project, I think, uh, in a creative, creative fiction class. Um, so again, we're trying to keep this spirit of a teaching press. We really want to produce, we want to be a publishers of work, not just a place where people come to do work, but also actively publishing. Um, we just had uh, a minor approved last fall, um, and now we have a minor in the book, which again taps into this interdisciplinary uh, curriculum where we bring studio art, uh, book arts, both in the form of book arts classes, uh, basic graphics classes, and printmaking classes. Um, we have history of the book classes, um, and English classes that work with text and image in some way, whether it's a poetry class or uh, a fiction class. And, and ideally, we would, we would expand this and we would bring science classes in there. Maybe we could have a science class that publishes a book about biology or something um, to kind of incorporate all this together. That might, maybe that would be an upper level course or something. So um, one of the things that I got really excited about when I came to the college was creating work rather than um, jumping up and down and waving my arms trying to get people to come to the press because it hadn't been alive for very long. I wanted to just affect the visual culture on campus and say, hey, we're here and we're making these things by hand, you should come check them out. And so, uh, in an effort to do that, I started producing posters for campus events uh, in the hopes that students would come, see those, and then find their way to the press. Um, it's, a, it's only a certain type of student who you really want doing this kind of work. They have to be real dedicated and peculiar uh, to really <laughs> stick around. Uh, so, I didn't, I didn't actively recruit people, I tried to do it more uh, subversively. Um, so this is a poster for a visiting writer, Jennifer Sain, who's a, who's a, a fiction author. Uh, this is, so now we're talking about letterpress printing, so for those of you who don't know that process very well, it's, uh, it was designed to print type. Um, the presses that most people use are proofing presses uh, to proof um, newspaper forms before they would go into production press or whatever. So this is handset type carved wood and uh, ornamentation from, from metal type. Um, and I'm just going to cruise through some of, the, some of this poster work that I did um, in the first few years I was there. Ira Glass from uh, of This American Life NPR fame came. So this is carved, uh, reductive carving of linoleum and uh, handset type and ornament. Uh, a lot of this is like has some hand lettering stuff to it. So this is hand drawn um, and then made into a plate 
this type uh, for Devochka, which is a local uh, Denver-based band. Um, this is a reductive cut of linoleum, three-color reduction of linoleum, and uh, some handset type and some uh, wood type. Uh, Robert Mezzi, who's a poet. Uh, Jonathan Alter came, and this is a, uh, again, um, layers and layers of color piled on top of each other. So reds, pinks, whites, then with a layer of black over the top, and then some gold uh, for the type. Um, I, I got really into this ge these geometric patterns, and uh, I created a system of, uh, much like uh, I think as Emily was doing here, a system of modular blocks that could be uh, set up in a, in a variety of patterns. So these were some vector illustrations I did and then had made into zinc, uh, zinc engraved blocks. Um, we had a little press celebration, we had some paper marbling, we, we tried to gather some book arts people together in our community. Um, the, the Front Range in the Rocky Mountain area is, um, it's, it's a little bit sparse with this sort of stuff. Our closest, I tell people our closest city, really, that's doing anything like this is Salt Lake and that's eight hours away. So we don't have a real great community for this. So we bring people in. Um, so we had, we had some paper marbling. We had the curator of the Wing Collection, which is a printing history collection at the Newberry Library, come and give a lecture. And Betty Bright came, who is a scholar, who is a book arts, independent book arts scholar. Um, this is a poster for book artist Charles Hobson, who came and uh, gave a workshop and gave a talk. Um, this is for, so I've also done some rock posters too, uh, and I've tried to get students uh, incorporated in doing that because they get real excited about uh, rock bands that they're interested in. So this is for Magnolia Electric Company, which came as part of a uh, concert series, or, or uh, sorry, a festival in the summer. So this is drawn and then carved linoleum uh, for the imagery. And then it's actually polymer plate uh, type from a digital phone. Uh, Here's another poster. This is for a band Mount Erie that played in Denver. Uh, this was this was an experiment in, in that series as well, but uh, I was experimenting with glow in the dark ink. So all this stuff over here that you see that's kind of this color <laughs> ends up glowing. And then there's a there's a raven, carp raven that's uh, on there in the left here. Right it's laid out. Uh, we have, we're blessed to have a really great visiting writer series, and uh, David Quammen, who is uh, an author who wrote for Outside Magazine for 20 years or so, and then uh, now writes for the National Geographic, he came, and he's a biogeographer specializing in um, uh, species that go extinct on islands, studying extinct species. So he was talking about the dodo, and we happened to have a book, it was really cool, that was a journal from an expedition in, the, I believe, the 17th century around the Indian Ocean. They stopped in Mauritius, the island of Mauritius, which is where the dodos were last seen. Uh, and so we had this cool uh, wood engraving of a dodo. So I reproduced that as a polymer plate for a little broad set. Um, this was a little, this was a small book, which is a, which is a republished essay of his called The Same River Twice, which is kind of a meditation on um, fly fishing and uh, being in the mountains of Montana. Um, some other small ephemeral works for visiting writers. This is a keepsake for um, Anthony Hecht. Uh, we had Billy Collins out a couple years ago, and so this is a broadside on handmade paper of a poem of his about Colorado. Um, some detail of some, some of the typographic work in these broadsides. Uh, this is a translation of a poem by Rimbaud. Uh, the translator is, a, a, is great. His name is Christian Book. I think it's a thing to invent name. But uh, he's, he happens to be uh, Canada's best-selling poet, I think. Um, interesting fellow. Spent some quality time with Christian. Um, and we produced a, an edition of 80 of these, uh, these keepsakes that are for sale. Um, so again, in the small book uh, idea, this is uh, Ron Padgett, who's a poet. Um, published a book of uh, an unpublished poem of his about a friend of his who died. Um, Palmer plate images uh, generated from digital files printed uh, three, three four color illustrations in handset type uh, in this small Japanese stab, stab down book. Um, and then this is a bit washed out, but uh, I also have been making some art prints as parts of shows. So uh, this is a collaboration with uh, a friend, Eleanor Annand. Uh, we did a series of prints for a show in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, or Durham, I guess, North Carolina. Uh, 
uh, prints, and then there's no answers. Uh, so other kinds of things that happen at uh, the press, we I have been doing what I call sort of rogue paper making. Uh, I like I like teaching paper making, but we don't really have a facility to do it, so we can only do it in the summer. It's a nice day out. We found this little courtyard, and we set up a whole paper making setup, and got some students involved in a project. Uh, I got a grant to do a project having to do with sustainability from the Sodexo Corporation, which is a like institutional food service people. Um, and so we, we were going to make a book project with uh, natural materials, um, trying to keep it real low tech and uh, in the spirit of sustainability, trying to convey a message. So we're, this is actually the, this is the president's house um, of the college. And I've, I, I gathered up a group of eight students and we marched over to the president's house and started uh, pulling all the dead iris leaves out of his front yard to make paper out of. So here's a, here's a picture of the pulp being beaten. Uh, this is about halfway through the cycle. Um, I wish I had a video of this because it looks kind of cool. It's pretty loud. But we beat the pulp and then we made uh, some paper. So here's a picture of me, uh, less hairy, uh, pulling a sheet of paper out of the vat. So this, uh, this mold and nettle is actually dipped in the vat and then you pulling it. Pull it. By pulling it out, you actually catch the fibers on the screen and that creates a sheet of paper. And so we produced an edition of books and a bunch <coughs> of prints that were hung uh, as an installation. Um, and this is, this is the results of the, the books that we made. We printed uh, uh, brightly colored patterns, layered uh, transparent colors of ink, and then assembled an accordion folded uh, case bound book. Uh, an edition of seven, variable edition of seven. Uh, and then that ended up also, you can see we, we hung these, we made these eight foot tall paper letters that spelled out infinite that went down this long hallway in, uh, in the art building. Um, so, uh, one of the coolest things that happened recently was that we moved we moved the press across campus, and I had a few slides of this that I thought I'd talk about. Um, we moved 186,000 pounds of stuff from one side of campus to the other. Type is made out of lead, right, which is not lightweight, and uh, we have a lot of type in the shop. We moved five presses. Actually, by we, I mean mostly these like linebacker type guys. <laughs> um, up those stairs, we used to be in this uh, kind of dungeon sort of basement. For 20 years, almost, the press was uh, in this basement. Uh, you can see the floors kind of falling apart. It was sinking from all the way to the presses. Uh, so all these went out that door. Uh, there's a there's a truck back up at the top that has a winch on it. They pulled them up out of that out of that basement space, trucked it across campus, and then we reset up shop on the other side. This press view, uh, and then a lot of people involved. <laughs> I tried to just stay away. I was I was biting my nails. Uh, so this is our new space. We moved across campus um, into a much nicer space. Uh, we had plywood put down on the floor so we could beat the crap out of it. And uh, we're ground floor now with more natural light. Uh, it's really wonderful. This is a student of mine named John who's producing a book um, of his father's poetry. His father died when he was 10 or 12. And uh, so this is the kind of thing that student, there are student initiated projects there. His father died when he was young and left him a box of stuff and in it were, were a bunch of unpublished poems. Um, so John decided to do an edition of ten of these books, publish his father's work, and ended up a, a really nice, really nice printed piece. Um, here's student Chelsea. She's uh, got some crazy lavender ink, making posters for uh, for some event on campus. And um, nowadays, I have I have tried to uh, give most of the responsibility of running that poster press to the students. So that's fairly self-sustaining now. They get paid uh, by departments to do posters for them. Uh, and we also offer community workshops. This is a workshop of uh, see a bunch of different age folks um, doing some binding of uh, photo portfolios. So we offer some of those kind of classes at night. Um, so the other big book production work that we do, um, they come more slowly. And as as I have time, and as I have time to involve students, this was the most recent publication by the press. Uh, we finished it last spring, late last spring. And this is a book of photographs of pre-Katrina New Orleans by a photographer named Stuart Clipper, uh, who is fairly well known. He, he had a solo show at MoMA in the early 90s of his work of Antarctica. And he had been traveling down to New Orleans for years to do Zydeco dancing and have, have a good old time. He lives up in uh, Minneapolis, and so he commutes down the Mississippi to New Orleans. And has a good time, and shoots photographs. 
and um, he approached me with this project. He, this, this book is 27 photographs of uh, kind of celebrating the city before the disaster and um, accompanied by text from local New Orleans authors, people who write for papers and poets and things like that, responding to the images and the time and the place uh, uh, that was there. Um, so this book, I have a copy of it here. That the, um, it, took, it took probably about a year's worth of design to get production work. Um, the, there's a slipcase that's made for it. This is a lot of uh, reclaimed, salvaged, hard pine weatherboards from flooded houses down there. Uh, somebody I know uh, had a whole backyard full of this wood. I just kind of lucked into it. So I was able to acquire a pallet load of it. And <clears throat> the book is kind of this long landscape format. Um, has a map of the city printed on the cover. And then uh, it has photographs, five of which are these uh, large format uh, photographs that fold out. So he, did, he works in this long landscape format. You can see um, on the other spreads, they lay like that on the page. So this is all letterpress printed text um, and uh, high quality uh, inkjet printing by the fancy word is Chiclet printed for this. We'll call it Chiclet. Um, but feel free to uh, look at this one too. Great, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about my journey to here and, and what I'm doing here at, the, at SCAP. Um, this is where I come from. This is Colorado Springs, uh, where Colorado College is and where I live. Uh, this isn't quite my view uh, out my window or anything, but uh, on, my, on my way to work I see this mountain every day. Uh, this is Pikes Peak, it's 14,000 feet tall, and um, it, has, uh, it, it informs my work in ways that I'm, I sort of only beginning to understand. It's not just the mountain, but this idea of living right next to these really dramatic landscapes. And part of the reason I was interested in coming to Florida was that I know that there are all kinds of landscapes that I don't understand and that are very foreign to me, and I've never spent any time in Florida. So I was interested in taking, uh, coming from my experiences in the Mountain West, uh, and my love of wandering around the woods and my sort of communing with the divine in an outdoor sense to uh, come to Florida and see how people, what people uh, interact with um, in these woods here and uh, what that feels like. Um, as uh, Denise mentioned in the introduction, I work for the National Outdoor Leadership School. I, I, uh, I lead wilderness trips in the summer um, in anywhere from Alaska to uh, Wyoming uh, in the Mountain West. And uh, I see in my students this uh, transformative experience of uh, feeling what it's like to live outside every day. And um, I think it's really important, and I think that uh, I believe in the environmental movement, but I, I sometimes worry that we're becoming so disconnected from that movement that we don't really understand what it is we're trying to save. Everybody wants to save the uh, polar bears. But I, I don't know if everybody knows why. I mean, besides they're cool animals. I mean, what, are the, what about the other things that we're trying to say? What about the, what makes a plant special, even though it's an animal, or not, or very slowly in um, So this project that I'm calling Days Have Gone By, I was listening to lots of John Fahey in the last month, and this is the title of one of his albums. And uh, it, uh, his music to me evokes landscape, and so I've been thinking about that a lot as I've been working on this project. So. Oh, <laughs> see if this works. So, um, I conceived of this project uh, last fall, um, the idea of, of creating a book project, an edition book project, that was uh, an interpretation of the natural landscape of northern Florida and the Tallahassee region. And um, I didn't know what to expect, I didn't know, I didn't know what I was going to find, but I uh, in this residency proposal, the first week, I decided that uh, I wanted to do research into what it's like. And so the only way to do that is to go out in the woods. So the first, the last week or so, I've been back in Tallahassee for now four days or so, but before that, I came, stopped in, dropped off some stuff, and then went out and started camping in the woods. But that week it was real cold out. I picked a, picked a good one. Yeah, but at least it was after the rain. Um, so. This was kind of my first experience. I went to Torreya State Park uh, first, which is kind of high bluffs so overlooking the Apalachicola River. 
I brought with me some equipment to do some sound recording. So this is this is kind of a portrait of my experience out in the woods with these all these uh, this wildlife that I don't I didn't understand. And then um, you know things like this Spanish moss, which I was calling wizard's beard until Brendan told me that it was called Spanish moss. <laughs> Um, uh, so before I came out, I was I was reading some things too. This book, the other Florida Bridget sent me, is is amazing. If you haven't read this book, um, it was written in the '60s by a woman who moved down here from the Northeast and was just traveling around, um, uh, investigating history and uh, the contemporary culture of the of the South at that time. Um, I got a lot of leads there and other things, and got interested in, in a bunch of other people to check out. Uh, one of them was Sidney Lanier, who was a poet in the Reconstruction South, who wandered around uh, this area a bunch and wrote uh, some some poetry. Uh, Will McLean, Florida's black hat troubadour. Um, I don't know if anybody see. I don't know if anybody knows these people. Right? I, I, I heard that he's Florida's black hat troubadour. I don't know what that means or if anybody knows that. Um, but he's cool. Um, Tate Cell State Forest, um, he wrote a song about the naming of that, this guy Tate. Do you all know this story? Okay, so you can tell me if I'm totally wrong. Uh, but basically the story goes, um, this guy Tate was living down in the forest near Tate's Hell, and um, he, I think he had some, he was raising some livestock or something, and a panther was harassing him. So the panther came, was coming to eat, eating his animals, and uh, so he decided he was going to go out and get them. So he, he, got his, he got his dogs and went out hiking through the swamp with the shotgun and uh, he got lost and he got separated from his dogs and the panther ate his dogs and uh, he, while he was looking he got bit by a, a snake and um, he, you know, he tied up the wound and tried to hike out and then um, some people came looking for him and they found him and his last words were, my name's Tate and I've just been through hell. <laughs> so that's why it's called Tate Tell. Did I get the story right? <laughs> anyway, that's the story according to the Will McLean song. So um, check it out. Uh, and then uh, John Muir. Do you all know who John Muir is? So he's, he's most well known for his uh, work in Yosemite Valley in California. I know him. Uh, he's sort of a, an icon in the, in the West. But it turns out that he, uh, when he was younger, he hiked. Uh, cross country from British Columbia to Florida, and it was his intention when he got to Florida to get on a boat and go to Africa to continue wandering. But as he was hiking through the swamp, he got malaria and couldn't make the journey, and so he went. He ended up going back to California to get well, and then he ended up uh, walking around in the redwoods. And they named uh, they named the Muir Woods, which are big, tall redwood trees out there for him. So, um, so he has. There's some. He kept a really good log of his adventures down here, and so there's stories written by him that are available out of him wandering through the swamps and not being able to find a, a dry place to sleep, which will come up in um, So I'm, I was also interested in this project in investigating um, my own interest in mathematics, art, and the natural world. I was actually a physics major as an undergraduate, so uh, these things kind of keep working their way back into my work. Um, some of this is uh, the, the idea that I have of, of communing with this spirituality in the woods um, is sort of, the, I see it in, in parallel ways to uh, Islamic art. And if you've looked at any of this stuff, the, the, the simplistic way of looking at it is that um, idolatry was the cardinal sin. Uh, so they weren't able to make representational art of the deity. So in order to, um, their, their culture's art was mostly these sort of uh, wonderfully complex patterns based on symmetries. Um, they were meditative and they were the, the idea was that they were the gateway. If you could calm your mind and absorb these patterns, that was your way of communicating with God through art. So all of these patterns are created through a variety of very simple uh, symmetry trans transformations. Um, this is kind of a quick diagram of how they work. Um, there's, there's four major types. Um, Translation is at the top where that diamond is moving from one place to the other. Rotation is the next one. Mirror reflection is the third one. And then glide reflection where something moves and flips over an axis is another one. So that's something I was interested in exploring. Um, <clears throat> the idea of, uh, has anybody seen an image like this before? This is, um, this is an idea in math. 
Um, it's a very simple idea of an automaton, which by creating a very specific set of rules, you can um, set this thing free and it will continue to generate um, successive layers of color based on the color that came before it. And it's something that you just set up a, a very set of a very simple set of six rules or something and will continue to generate these patterns. So this is this is the pattern that one of these automatons generates. And you find that uh, everybody uh, or mo a lot of people are more familiar with uh, something like the um, Fibonacci sequence, which is a sequence of adding successive numbers that shows up in pine cones and um, all sorts of things that have swirl kind of shapes in them in nature. So this is another one. You can see this demonstrated uh, strikingly in the shell of this um, this snail in, in the ocean. Um, and for this project, I wanted to create a sound piece to wrap you into that environment. I didn't want to just play sounds of being out there. So I uh, created an algorithm that can take um, colors and sound, and uh, I can translate that into a sequence of um, automatons that then get mapped to um, instruments, uh, MIDI instruments, that will play a sequence of sounds. So from these um, images and sounds, I can generate and abstract those into other interesting compositions. So I'll play just briefly one of those compositions. This was one I made from... I'm making an edition of 50 books, and those will each have a unique composition based on a location uh, that I traveled to uh, during my camping excursion. Um, so there'll be it'll be an edition project, but it also have a unique. <coughs> um, so these were back in Colorado. I was doing studies on how I would create the structure. I kind of wanted to use some natural materials. I, I uh, for the binding part, I, I used leather. Um, and then I was working with uh, folded paper to figure out the paper, the structure of the actual binding. I wanted to have capture the idea of movement through a space. So um, just as if you were walking through a forest or something, I wanted to see if I could recreate that experience in an intimate way, as something you could hold in your hands, um, to kind of evoke the spirit of being there, not in a literal way, but to just um, kind of translate the idea of how uh, of what kind of feelings I got from being in the, in the woods. So this is an example of, of the folding I was doing in the page structure as a mock-up. So I'm going to take you real quick through some of the, just the basic adventures I have. I, I like riding bikes, and so the way that I decided to do a little tour out there was I was going to go do some overnight trips um, on my bike with a little trailer behind me. So I have a little Rubbermaid tub. That's all my stuff, minus the food. The food's already in the box. But uh, then I pack it all up, and it, it, it gets pretty sleek. Here, um, it ride, the trailer rides on one wheel and just rides on the back axle of the bike. So I can cruise around. So I was going to do a little overnight. So I want to do a multiple day thing, but um, we'll talk more about that later. So this is in Torreya State Park. Um, uh, this is the Torreya tree. The, there are hardly any of these that exist anymore. Um, and they only exist in this area in Northern Florida. I found one of those. That was cool. Some magnolias. I think those magnolias. This was my first campsite. So I had ridden several miles into this bluff overlooking the Apalachicola River. Um, this is a real beautiful spot. I thought I was in the middle of nowhere until I noticed that there was a houseboat parked you know, right out <laughs> right the shore there. Um, but it felt pretty alone. Um, it was cold out, and it's winter, so uh, there aren't too many people out, uh, which is pretty neat. But uh, yeah, so I got there right at sunset. This was a real pretty time to be there. There's, this is looking back up at that sun, and here's my, here's my kind of rig, and then the, the light falling across the pines. Um, here's my only shot of myself. It was not taken by somebody else. Uh, as, as I gave myself away. I was like, I'll take a photo that looked like somebody took uh, of me when I was riding, but I left my camera box in the picture so you could tell that I just dropped it there when I was walking back. Um, they asked me cruising through the pines. It, it was real neat up in those bluffs. Um, it's very much different than the swamp I expected. It's, it's high, it's dry, it feels very desert like. It feels, it feels actually a lot like being in the high desert back home. Um, this was a particularly sunny, warm day, too, by the time I got moving um, with pine trees. Uh, sandy, real sandy though, sandy trail, that's different. We don't have a lot of sand. So some of the other colors and shapes that uh, I found striking out there. 
Um, I went to Florida Caverns and I found some of the Trillium that were in bloom. I got kind of a hot tip that these, this Trillium you can go check out. So um, I was blown away by the colors involved here. This patterning on the, on the leaves was particularly interesting to me and the, those really deep, rich purple colors. Um, I climbed into this cave. Um, there's some cavern tours there, but I was on. I was there on the. They, they don't have them on Tuesday and Wednesday, so I was there. I missed out on the tour. But uh, I walked around and um, did a little tour there and climbed into this cave and uh, sat there for a while and just kind of sucked it in and reported some of the drip going on. You know, this is still. Uh, there's still water soaking out of the ground. I think from that um, a big rainstorm that we had for a couple weeks. Ago. I had my rubber boots on. I was stomping around this puddle in this little tunnel cave. Um, I didn't see the really uh, sexy animals that you want to see here. I didn't see a panther. I didn't see a bear. I didn't see an alligator. I saw so lots of signs that keep out of the water. Um, but I saw an egret. I saw a bunch of egrets. Um, and this is down in the mangrove swamp. There. Um, so. The next thing I wanted to do, I, I knew I wanted to get out for a couple days. I wanted to see wilderness. I wanted to see what Florida's wilderness were like. I was in these state parks, and they were, I could get away from people, but it wasn't like being in the middle of nowhere by myself. So I wanted to go to, into the Bridewell Bay wilderness. I, what I read about was that um, there were, it was some of the hardest hiking possible. It was like up to your waist, waiting, stuff. Um, that didn't sound ideal. Um, I didn't think I was tough enough for that. So, uh, but I just wanted to get near it. Uh, also, some of the only virgin... Uh, virgin uh, pines in the state of Florida are in the middle of this swamp. Um, and I was hoping to get close to those. And there's lots of carnivorous plants. That, yeah. I'll take you there Sunday. You really? Can. Yeah. I've been through there many times. Anybody else wants to come along too? Let's all go! Let's go right now! <laughs> awesome. It's hard. I bet. It seemed cold too. I mean, I was like, I was by myself. Anyway. It sounds like you need a park. Let's do it, son. All right. <laughs> um, so I thought that maybe I could um, I could get in at least close to it. So I, I drove, I was coming down from the south, so I drove to this trail at Langston House, and no cell, well, I don't know if you can see it, but this is not marked as swamp, or this is marked as swamp over here, so not marked as swamp over here. So I was like, okay, great, well, I can ride into that trail and get close. So things things are great. I mean, you can see where this is going, right? All right. Things, things turn out great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, cruising along, no problem. Riding for maybe 20 minutes or something like this on a, on a two-track. Uh, pretty day out, beautiful, sunny and warm. So I, I get a little bit farther down and you know, it's, like been, it's clear that it's been raining for a little while because there's still some leftover water in these dirt tracks. Yeah, that's no problem. Um, you know, little puddles won't stop me. Then, um, then the puddles started getting bigger and the two-tracks started getting filled in. And, uh, but it was still was a big deal because I could just ride up in the middle of the two track and it was still, still dry and cruise along there. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, then this. So I thought maybe this was just a localized depression uh, that I could just, I could just, I could push. I had my rubber boots. I brought my rubber boots along. I pushed through this for, I don't know, probably an hour or so, just thinking that maybe I'd get out of it to the other side of it. I think I was just going deeper. Yeah, and this is like, of course, you're laughing at me, right? Because you're like, this guy from Colorado doesn't know anything about the swamp here. What's that? We said the grass is brown on the other side too. Oh, is that your time? <laughs> um, yeah. So I got I got totally defeated by the swamp, which was like a great experience. I didn't get to, I didn't get to go do what I wanted to do, but um, I, I got a healthy respect for the wet Florida ground. Um, there's another picture of like you know, um, this, the muck that was accumulating on the back. Uh, so I did what any smart person would do. I went to the beach. <laughs> I got out of there. I was I was pretty brokenhearted uh, after not getting in there. So I drove south and I went to the mouth of the Apalachicola River and I drove out to St. George, St. George Island, um, and did a little tour. Uh, there's a there's a state park on the north end of that, and I did a little tour along the beach up there and. Uh, just to get some experience of what that's like too, because that seems important. And I found an awesome little camp spot. So here's me camping out on the beach in St. George. And uh, yeah, it was real pretty there. Uh, there were some of these tannic lakes uh, that were making really lovely color gradients. Um, 
And so I came back here, and uh, now I'm I'm at SCAP. I'm working on this project. I've been I've been going for a couple days now. Um, this is the next incarnation. This is not the final version of the of the book, but it's getting closer to that. Um, this is the this is the color leather I'm using. I've been using um, some of the unique facilities here. I've been using the laser engraver to cut blocks that I'm going to be printing from. So uh, again, these uh, tiling patterns and grids and things like that. Um, I've also been cutting, printing some gradations and cutting patterns into the, into the paper, that's a piece of paper itself, and um, exploring how I can cut and engrave the leather itself. It's a very really interesting thing to do. Um, and making prints, all these prints are being made on a letter press. And here's a, um, here's a, my first couple print prints, um, laying down some colors of green um, on top of this, on top of this paper I have, um, that will end up as sheets in the book. Um, and here's my plug. <laughs> and there's me. So come see me. Uh, Thursday, March 4th, uh, from noon to 2. And uh, you can come check out books and uh, see more posters. And I'll have other stuff up. And you'll be able to see the work that I'm working on while, uh, while I'm at residency. So uh, thanks for your attention.